Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Theo. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to be introducing this evening our two speakers. This is a, a first for, for me anyway, in chairing one of these uh, Centre for Yoga Studies events. Um, I should have introduced myself as well, if anyone doesn't know. I'm Jim Mallon, so I'm the chair of the TOA Centre for Yoga Studies. And so this evening we've got Christopher Jane Miller and Jonathan Dickstein presenting uh, all the way from California. Uh, Christopher J. Miller completed his PhD in the study of religions at uh, UC Davis, University of California, Davis, and he's currently serving as the Bhagwan Malinat Assistant Professor of Jain and Yoga Studies at Loyola Marymount University, which is in uh, LA, and for those of you who don't know, it's one of the few other uh, universities in the world with an MA in, in Yoga Studies, and uh, Christopher lectures internationally on all things yoga, is a certified continuing education provider for Yoga Alliance and is the co-founder of Hot House Yoga Education. And speaking uh, with Christopher is Jonathan Dickstein, who's a PhD candidate in religious studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And his dissertation is, uh, is Animals in Hindu South Asia from Cosmos to Slaughterhouse. And it explores Vedic and Hindu animal taxonomies and dietary ethics and their influence on contemporary norms and politics. Jonathan has published on animals and diet in various journals, including Philosophy East and West, Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, Food Ethics, and elsewhere. And just to say before uh, I let them get going, if you ask a question, will you please, if you, you know, if you have someone in, in mind that you want it to go to, either Jonathan or Christopher, please do so. Uh, otherwise, I will choose and uh, hopefully I'll get it right. Anyway, uh, that uh, that's it from me. I'll see you at the end when I'll be chairing the questions. So now it just uh, remains for me to hand over to Christopher and Jonathan, who are going to talk to us on Jane Veganism, Ancient Wisdom, New Opportunities. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Jim, for that uh, kind introduction and for having us, as well as Theo and all those at the SOAS Center of Yoga Studies for your generosity and inviting Jonathan and I to share our research on Jane veganism with you all. So I want to briefly just tell you a little bit about the background of this project to give you a sense of why we're even looking at this topic of Jane veganism. And as you can see from the title here, Ancient Wisdom, New Opportunities, there's something that's being connected between the past and the present that Jonathan and I are exploring. This initial curiosity of mine into this topic arose when I was talking to a vegan friend of mine who is a Jane, but who lives in Switzerland. And this friend of mine was describing his practice of veganism in very Jane karmic terms. And so as probably a lot of us know, but maybe not everyone, in Jainism, karma is a, an actual substance that sticks to the soul and binds the soul in the world of suffering. And the way he was describing his practice of veganism, he was using these this kind of language, as I'll show you later in the presentation, to describe why he was practicing veganism. And so we wanted to unpack that. And when I started talking to my colleague, Jonathan, here at the University of California, just north of me, he said, what's happening here is we're seeing that Jains, in, particularly in the diaspora, but also now in India, are seeing new opportunities to practice ahimsa and to think about karma through the practice of what we're gonna call transnational veganism. So what we're going to do today is briefly walk you through what we mean by transnational veganism. We're gonna, Jonathan's gonna define that for you up front. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Jane karma theory for those who are unfamiliar with it to show you how Jains who think with karma theory are, are articulating their Jane veganism. Jonathan will then show you some of these new opportunities from transnational veganism that Jains are finding through their practice of veganism. And then I will show you some of the actual data that we have collected from three different case studies, if you wanna call them that, of diasporic Jain veganism. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Great, thank you so much, uh, Chris. Uh, thank you, Theo and Jim and the center for, for hosting us and everybody for uh, showing up to this talk. Um, so the, the unique focus of you know, today's presentation doesn't permit um, an extended elaboration on veganism as a concept and practice, um, but I think that some, elabor some elaboration is necessary, some clarity 
uh, prior to proceeding into a discussion of veganism among diasporic Jains. Um, what may initially seem simple, that is some kind of unanimous, easy understanding of veganism, is really anything but. Um, I even myself recall speaking to a fellow yoga practitioner years ago who was surprised that while I didn't consume animal products, I did consume alcohol. And I really didn't understand how they were connecting the two. I mean, I could, you know, I could guess, but it, it wasn't clear. Uh, but perhaps fortunately for today's talk, our working definition for veganism is the minimal one that is also seemingly the most prevalent. And this is the abstention from the consumption of animal derived products. It is an ideologically and motivationally neutral term exclusively describing a pattern of action. Thus it functions similar to a term like bicyclism which solely denotes the practice of bicycling, despite the many motivations people may actually have for, for cycling. So in short, the term veganism is conduct descriptive and not belief or identity descriptive. It signifies what one does, or in this case, what one does not do, um, rather than what one believes or is. Uh, next slide, Chris. So this understanding this kind of conduct centric definition has a lot of precedent. Actually here pictured is Donald Watson, uh, the co-founder of the Vegan Society, who while was uh, using and deploying the term vegan for, for, uh, for years, was kind of pushed to come to a definition of veganism, this kind of ism of veganism. And in 1944, late 1944, and here in 1945 in the, the Vegan News, produced by the Vegan Society, Watson you know, furnished this definition. And the first definition here, I mean, the others below it actually just describe it uh, more in detail, but the term itself, it says here, veganism is the practice of living upon fruits, nuts, vegetables, grains, and other wholesome non-animal foods. So here, the kind of original formulation was practice centric. And it really wasn't later when um, others gave a little bit of pushback and what I would say wanted to create a more expansive definition of veganism uh, that we start to see uh, many of the trends that exist now in contemporary debates about veganism or at least discussions. So uh, next slide, Chris. So, so that being said, I really should highlight that increasingly in online discussions, media coverage, debates within vegan and animal rights communities, and in the fast growing academic literature on veganism the terms definition and the many adjectives that have been attached to it have come to encapsulate much more than a simple non-action. Many tie the definition of veganism to a particular ethical political project, most commonly a pro-animal rights position that rejects animals' commodity status as a matter of principle. But others see veganism as a, quote, all-encompassing anti-exploitation ethic, end quote, that extends beyond mere concerns for animals. And veganism has been variously construed as a philosophy, a political movement, a cultural movement, an anti-establishment politic, an ethical and political commitment, and a lifestyle. Veganism has also been nominally qualified to indicate categorical subdivisions, include veganism that is abolitionist or radical. It has been conceptualized using any number of schema and spectra, including a now orthodox typology of ethical veganism, environmental veganism, and health veganism. There's a split between identity veganism and aspirational veganism and degrees of veganism. There is also an ever-growing list of prefixes that do not describe an approach to veganism as much as broader political alignments, such as, and quite improbably so, Trump veganism and carceral veganism. These are actual terms. This variance is on the one hand unremarkable, definitions of words change over time in response to common usage and the efforts of different actors to reshape their meaning. Yet we would argue that this diversity of interpretations and redefinitions is problematic for two main reasons with full explanations beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, and I've co-authored a couple papers on this for anyone that's interested to see, you know, to get deeper into these uh, explanations. But first, many of these more expansive definitions for veganism are actually logically incoherent, either due to internal ambiguity or contradiction or due to conceptual recklessness. And what I mean in the latter case is that these definitions derive their meaning by appropriating the meanings of other extant concepts. Um, and 
on a pragmatic level, both of these conceptual issues also impede their, their usefulness, both in academia and one could also say for, for advocacy. And second, these definitions also frequently marginalize the strictly practice-based definition given above, um, which we would argue is alternatively both coherent and useful. Next slide. So if that's the case, if we accept that at least, you know, um, for, for this talk and, you know, we can have a longer conversation and there's other literature delving into that, then we can, you know, at the outset here, understand veganism as a stable, plausible and useful term is one that's conduct and not belief or identity descriptive. And thus transnational veganism is a global practice movement. So it's a practice movement, conduct centric, comprised of innumerable, often uncoordinated groups and individuals abstaining from animal derived products. Worldviews and motivations undergirding the practice may vary, but the effect remains the same, an abstention on the personal level and a boycott on the structural level. And this transnational and structural effect, that is a mass boycott of animal exploiting industries, permits us to speak of a politically inflected transnational veganism, even in the absence of a standardized unifying ideology. So just to clarify this, at the structural level, veganism as only practice remains a type of practice movement. Uh, or to quote Julia Eckert, it's a form of explicitly political, quote, unorganized and unrepresented, but nonetheless collective action, end quote. So why is this, why is this relevant? Why is this important specifically for our discussion of Jane veganism? Next slide. So there's often in many ways this kind of concern or debate about Jane as a uh, veganism as a justice practice or an ascetic practice, other oriented or self-oriented. Accepting veganism as conduct descriptive um, is as merely conduct descriptive is key and clarifies this by helping us to unproblematically read Jane veganism as a real veganism, you know, quote unquote, real veganism within the broader transnational movement. And this is the case even if Jane veganism's prevalent anchoring in distinctive religious metaphysics and motivations are generally ignored, rejected, or unknown to the non-Jane and dominantly Western vegan world. Because regardless of whether Janes adopt veganism to reduce the sufferings and deaths of animals and humans, or as will be discussed next, to avoid karmas that postpone their own liberation, the effect is once again the same. So as uh, the image uh, you know, kind of reveals, why don't we both? On to you, Chris. So we'll return to this concept of transnational veganism in a moment. And right now, what I just want to briefly do is go over some of the fundamentals of the ways that Jain vegans are thinking about their practice from a soteriological perspective, or in terms of trying to get a better birth or liberation. So I think it almost goes without saying, of course, that ahimsa is the bedrock of Jainism, non-harming or non-violence. And particularly for diasporic Jains, this idea comes from a story in the Acharanga Sutra, or is at least grounded in a story in the Acharanga Sutra, of Mahavira's fundamental insight, which you see here in three parts, which he says as he's looking around with his eyes open, meditating on all the life around him, that one should not act sinfully towards earth, water, fire, wind, plants, and animals, nor cause others to act so, nor allow others to act so. And so there's this three-part form of nonviolence that I'll go through in more detail later that is set up in the Acharanga Sutra that sets the foundation for a lot of the inspiration for why Jains and particularly Jains in the diaspora focus so much on the topic or the concept and the practice of nonviolence. This of course leads to an embodiment or a sense of a hierarchy of life based on the way that one is embodied according to the number of senses they have. And so for a Jain, of course, they would only want to eat one sensed beings, especially, for example, plants and things that come from the elements. Because if a Jain is to harm anything in the two, three, four, or five sense categories, they are inflicting increasing amounts of pain because these beings can sense and experience more than the one sense beings. And as these 
beings go from two to three to four to five cents, the amount of karma that is associated with the violence inflicted upon their bodies increases for the person who's inflicting the violence, right? So the goal here, as you see at the bottom of the slide, is to realize, first of all, that nothing wants to be harmed and to especially avoid causing harm to categories two through five. Because when we commit acts of harm to those in increasing degrees, we have karma that flies into our soul as a jain. This particular philosophy is described both in oral and written traditions in Jain texts. The one I want to draw our attention to right now is the Tattvarta Sutra, and particularly the copy that you see here and then I also have here by Natamal Tatya that was translated first in 1994 and then again at the beginning of our current 21st century for diasporic Jains particularly. And why this is important is because it articulates in English for a diasporic Jain who may not be able to understand uh, the other languages, um, even vernacular languages, it articulates for them a particular way to understand Jain karma theory, and it's widely used and widely cited. So just briefly, of course, according to the Tattvarta Sutra, we all have a soul, a jiva, and that soul is trapped in what it is not, a jiva, number two here. And the goal here is to liberate oneself from the suffering of the world by following the next steps three through seven that will be laid out in the text in which I'm going to bring you through right now briefly. So according to the text, what happens is, as you see in the picture on the right, karma particles flow into and stick to our soul. They come running in, as you see the Sanskrit root for asrava comes from, they come running in and they stick to our soul on account of any kind of harm that we inflict upon the world. Most of this harm is caused by four passions, as you see here, anger, pride, deceit, and greed. And these passions incite three forms of action, action of the body, speech, and or mind that cause this karma to flow in. Now, this karma can either be good karma, punya, which is better, of course, than bad karma, papa, and Jains would, especially householders, be aiming to do things such as charity to gain punya karma, to gain a better future birth. But what we want to focus on in this particular lecture are the forms of papa karma and how they are associated with the contemporary practice of Jain veganism. So we're going to focus on how that negative karma can come in or bad karma, papa karma, and stick to the soul. Another interesting thing, since we're presenting at the center of yoga studies, is that the word that is used for action in the Tattvarta Sutra is yoga. And so here yoga takes on a pejorative connotation because yoga causes the karma to fly into the soul. So you want to do the opposite. You want to do a yoga. You want to not practice yoga in this particular tradition and text. Now, there are three types of yoga, if you want to put it this way, and the text does, that cause karma to flow into the soul. The first is kirta. This is action that is performed by oneself. So this is if someone were to go out and hurt something directly, an animal or something like that, they would automatically have karma flow into their soul. The second is karita. This is for someone, if they want to eat meat, for example, they would have the butcher do the work for them. As Jonathan likes to say, it's a mercenarial relationship. The butcher kills the animal and then you eat the animal and then that gives you a certain amount of karma that will flow into your soul. The third one is anumata. This is action that is approved in the sense that we don't make an intervention on behalf of the world, on behalf of action of violence that's happening right in front of us. And so we'll see how these categories of particularly kurta and karita fit in really well with the practice of contemporary Jain veganism. And of course, these three types of yoga, these type, three types of action must be avoided in order to not have more karma stick to your soul. What happens if you perform one of these actions is that these karmic particles will flow into your soul and stick to your soul. The word for that is bandha, the binding of karmic soul particles to your soul. And again, in yoga, we like to think of bandha as different things that we do with our bodies or our subtle bodies in order to have particular effects. But here in this text, the word bandha is used again in more of a pejorative sense. It's not a good thing for karma to stick to your soul, obviously. And that is what Jains realize, and that's part of the Jain path, because in numbers five and six, Sambara and Nirjara, the first thing you're trying to do is stop the inflow of these karmic particles. And as I like to tell my students when I teach this, because Sambara comes from the verbal root Samvara to cover up, you're kind of hitting the deck and you're, you're, you're 
dodging these karmic particles, but you're doing that by stopping your involvement in any action of violence to the utmost as much as you can to stop those particles from flying in and attaching to your soul. Hopefully then you will enter the stage of nirjara, which is where you're actually performing tapas to kind of wear out and burn away any karmic particles that are on your soul from prior lives and, and actions you've taken in this life. And the text says here, tapasa nirjara cha, with austerity, your karma is worn away. And what's really interesting about this particular practice, and we'll look a little bit at it more later in the case studies, is that there are six external austerities that one can perform in order to wear away karma. The first of these is fasting. The second is semi-fasting or reducing your diet. The third is limiting your foods and variety and access to foods. And the fourth is giving up delicacies and stimulating food. So what's interesting to me about this is that these first four, which I've presented within Jain circles as well, really overlap with the practice of veganism because there is a certain cutting out of certain things, a reduction of certain things, a limitation of certain things for a higher soteriological or religious or spiritual purpose. So we'll revisit that in just a moment. But of course, all of this is in service. These austerities, this tapas, this internal heat that we generate is all in service in the Jain tradition, and particularly in the Tattvartha Sutra, to reach moksha or liberation. And the text says, when all the karmic bondage is eliminated, the soul soars upwards to the border of cosmic space. And as you see in the picture to the right here, sits with all of the other liberated souls in a state of uh, omniscience. So this is the, of course, the ultimate religious goal for Jains, what they are trying to pursue. And as we'll see, uh, veganism, the practice of veganism is becoming a new opportunity for them to be able to see or, or to, to advance on that particular path. So Jonathan, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Wonderful, thanks, Chris. Um, so kind of entering into a discussion about these new opportunities, I think it is important to highlight a difference between non-killing and non-harming, because I think that notably, but, but strangely often overlooked is how unlike some Abrahamic codes that exclusively prohibit killing, Ahimsa is an ethical principle, principle concerned with harming in all forms um, and causing another's death is merely regarded as the most serious violation. Um, and that being said, and before dealing with some non-lethal forms of harming, so that's gonna be the focus here is talking about all these kind of non-lethal forms of harm, uh, which, which are in advance of say slaughter, um, but we should also recognize the ubiquity, if not kind of necessity of killing in the dairy and egg industries. I think this is often overlooked, this idea that, that killing is not you know, embedded in these industries. Um, or to quote uh, Yamini Narayanan, quote, the dairy industry is a slaughter industry, end quote. Um, in the dairy sector, unproductive females and males must be sold and slaughtered to maintain profitability with profits used to purchase even more cows. And while the focus of animal protection is commonly on meat, and I think this is even in India and in the West, um, which are framed as these industries of killing, apparently these are the sole industries of killing, um, we should note that at least in India, beef and leather are actually the byproducts of the dairy industry. There is no dairy specific industry in India. And so I think it's important to recognize that. Next slide, Chris. But the point here is actually to discuss a little bit of these new opportunities to kind of shift the way, uh, shift the focus away from slaughter. Um, you know, I think even in Western discussions, there's also always a discussion about the killing of animals, but oftentimes the killing of animals in certain settings is almost, uh, you know, unbelievably the, the kind of best thing that could happen to them, given how awful their prolonged existence could be. Um, but new opportunities here refers to previously unrecognized, neglected, or unconvincingly rationalized sites of himsa that have increasingly concerned contemporary Jains, especially in the, the diaspora. And we could speculate that this kind of new awareness has actually been produced by phenomena prevalent and visible in the diaspora, such as sophisticated animal rights and environmentalist movements, as well as literature and videos highlighting the myriad problems with industrial and non-industrial animal farming. Uh, and so while killing is often assumed to be the core or highest priori pri priority himsa related concern in both Indic and Western discussions about violence towards animals, 
uh, we should mind that philosophers and dominantly Western philosophers have long questioned the assumption that death is in fact the most serious harm or even a harm at all to the one who dies, right? Because you're dead, so how can you experience the harm if you're dead, which is different than, than dying? Um, and so the claim that killing is the greatest form of himsa could be less persuasive than it initially seems. But you know, be that as it may, by contrast, the harms experienced while living, at least by animals for the, the sake of the discussion today, such as those associated with manipulation, confinement, mutilation, natal alienation, and other forms of deprivation are much easier to assert as clear instances of harming. And these harms are present in varying degrees in both industrial and non-industrial dairy production and other animal industries. And we should certainly mind that, at least in the United States, uh, sites of extreme harm infliction, HIMSA infliction, uh, known as factory farms, account for 99%, upward of 99% of all available animal products. Next slide. So for some accounts of the harms in the dairy sector in both India and the West, I you know, highly recommend the work of Catherine Gillespie's, uh, who has recently published The Cow with Ear Tag 1389, and Yamini Narayanan uh, at Deakin College in Australia, who has written uh, numerous articles on, on dairying in India and has a, a book coming out soon. Um, now, many of these instances or these kinds of just you know, manipulation, deprivation, mutilation, and so on, um, are not you know, unique to the dairy industry. They occur in other industries as well. Um, but in these industries, specifically dairy and egg industries, or what Carol Adams calls feminized protein industries, there are specific harms that occur only there. And so I'll kind of highlight them here. Um, and these are situations in which the reproductive processes of animals are the direct and kind of integral site of intervention. So to give an example, to cite Narayanan, uh, next slide. So quote, dairying and egg industries require the reproductive systems of cows, buffalo, sheep, goats, camel, and chickens and other avians to be constantly in production. To achieve this, the animals are subjected to forcible sexual penetration at human hands. Dairying involves acts that could be easily considered bestiality in non-farming spaces, such as the human masturbation of the bull for sperm extraction and forcible human-driven penetration of animal vaginas and anuses to inseminate them for breeding." End quote. So oftentimes, non-lethal harms, um, and most commonly harms such as these that are, you know, certainly categorizable as instances of, of sexual violence are explained away, you know, in, in I think it's kind of a, a pan-Indic apologetics, um, but you oftentimes, you know, see it very much now prevalent in kind of very staunchly pro-dairy, uh, pro-Hindu, pro-Hindutva kind of circles, um, appeals to the alleged consent on the part of bovine victims. So this is narrativized with slogans of the cow as a quote giver or cow as a mother to her human manipulators. When, you know, obviously dairying is an extractive process. It's not a giving process. And bovines have their own children. Their, their children are not human children. They're you know, bovine children. And so, you know, contemporary vegan feminist critiques of dairy, such as those offered by Narayanan, uh, quote, destabilize ideas of the human cow relation as one enacted in harmony and reciprocal care and suggest, just, and suggest that there is historical and contemporaneous complicity of silence on the ethical problematics of commodifying animal lactation, end quote. So these are kind of new opportunities, new sites that, that, are, that are being highlighted. Uh, next slide, Chris. So these are only some of the new opportunities, the ones that are animal centric, but there are anthropocentric opportunities as well that tend to involve uh, indirect harms to humans through animal farming and notably increasingly industrialized animal farming. Um, and so we can see instances here, here are just some examples 
um, of some human implicating harms that have also come to the attention of diasporic Janes, but not just diasporic Janes, not just Janes, um, and, not, and not even those kind of even related to Indic traditions. Um, and these forms of himsa are such as um, include the, the brutal conditions under with often migrant workforces labor, uh, the human and non-human impacting environmental degradations caused by industrial farming's contribution to anthropogenic climate change, industrial farming's roots in settler colonial ethnic extermination and the expropriation of land, industrial farming's kind of ongoing dislocation or dislocating impact on rural human communities of large-scale industries. You see this immensely in the United States, North Carolina, and Iowa, and so on. And lastly, and perhaps just most well-known, are the diet-related diseases and other negative health outcomes stemming from industrial, quote, cheap food regimes, which, if you delve a little bit more into the literature, uh, very uh, disproportionately affect uh, negatively uh, marginalized human communities. So just to kind of sum up this notion of ancient windows and new opportunities here, new opportunities is referring to the ways in which Jains in the diaspora, but now also increasingly in India, are seeing all these other himsas, you could say, embedded in these industries and why it may seriously require a rethinking um, and, and a, you know, a quickly enacted uh, reorientation towards, towards dairy consumption. Back to you, Chris. So with these opportunities that Jonathan is describing in mind, I want to take us through in this last part, three case studies that we're looking at specifically in an article that we hope to publish soon. And I also wanted to make a point at this moment to thank our peer reviewers who gave us some really good feedback that has contributed to some of the things we're presenting to you in this particular presentation. The three case studies that I would like to present to you are the Jane Center of Southern California here in the US. And then I'm going to go to you in the UK. I'm going to go to Jane Vegans. And then we're going to come back to California briefly and finish there with Vegan Janes in Northern California. So just to get us started off here, I want to talk about the Jane Center of Southern California, which is in our neck of the woods. It was established in 1979 and just before Jaina was established, which is the organization that oversees all of the Jane organizations in North America. And it was, as you see here, this is Dr. Yasfant Modi, who's the former president of this center, who in 2018 advocated for the center to go vegan. And to my knowledge, this is the only fully vegan Jane center in the United States. There are vegan options at other centers, but under the, his leadership, uh, there was a vote made and the center went completely vegan and it still is. And this is a place where I take my students every semester when, when COVID is not around, of course, and we go visit and the students get to learn Jane ritual. They get to see Jane's in action. They get to meet Jane's. And then of course, at the end, they get to have a great vegan meal served by uh, the Jane temple itself. The idea here with Dr. Modi was that he himself was vegan. And at this point, he and others within the Jane community want to make all the Jane centers vegan uh, throughout the United States. So there's now there's this push to help other Jane centers and Janes individually to see the opportunities to practice nonviolence through veganism that Jonathan pointed out. Now, interestingly, and this is a good kind of place to start to understand where we're going with all this to bring it all together, is that Dr. Modi mentioned to me when I talked to him about why are you vegan? Why, why is the center vegan? The first thing he mentioned, of course, was Jane philosophy and particularly ahimsa, nonviolence or non-harming. And in specific, he named three things that are very common within uh, transnational, what we're calling transnational veganism. He said, you know, there's less violence to the animals because there's no dairy involved in veganism. It's better for our health and it's better for the environment. Now, as we said before at the beginning, transnational veganism we're conceiving mainly as a practice, but these are, of course, if you ask anyone why they're vegan, these are three of the primary motivations that you'll hear around the world among the other many uh, motivations that Jonathan pointed out at the beginning of the article. But Dr. Modi mentioned these three to me, and I thought it's a good way to start to think about how Janes are seeing the opportunities here for animals, health, and environment, among other things, in the diaspora specifically. Our 
sort of big case study for this article is Jane Vegan. So now we're in the UK, which was established in 2008, as you see here, to help Jane's transition toward a low HIMSA lifestyle. They have a big online presence, and particularly during the Jane Festival of Paryushan, the Holy Festival of Paryushan every year, during which they run their annual Give Up Dairy for Paryushan campaign. So just briefly, during Paryushan, what Jains do is they ask for forgiveness for violence that they've inflicted on others, pain they've caused others um, and other beings in the, over the past year since the last Paryushan. They ask for forgiveness and they do various practices of tapas, including, for example, fasting. And what the Jain vegans are asking Jains to do every Paryushan is to consider in these sort of practices of, of tapas or purification or repentance or whatever you want to call them, that they instead decide to give up dairy for that period and perhaps forever to see what that is like. And so you can see how giving up dairy for Paryushan kind of fits in with this, this soteriological or ascetic logic, at least for lay householders, and that the Jain vegans are seeing the opportunity in veganism to offer that as a way to, to practice uh, the Jain, the Jain uh, religion. Now, what's interesting also is they kind of call out how Jains among the abhakshyas or the, the forbidden foods within Jainism, Jains will not eat today root vegetables, a lot of them will, not everyone, but they'll, they do not want, particularly in the Jain centers, to have root vegetables included in their food. And what the Jain vegans point out is that, you know, there's a lot more violence in dairy today than there is in root vegetables, um, which may have been, you know, pretty violent in the past. But in comparison, you'd be doing a lot, you'd be giving up a lot less or a lot more violence by giving up dairy for Paryushan instead. They have a really robust international WhatsApp group that I'll come back to in a moment because it's, it's through that WhatsApp group that they very graciously allowed us to share a survey that we'll share the results of in a moment. What I wanna first draw our attention to is one of the pages on for this Paryushan campaign, campaign on Jane Vegan's website. This is a snapshot of that where they highlight the violence in milk production. And as you can see here, they are naming many of the violences that Jonathan just mentioned, and that are mentioned kind of in the transnational, what we're calling transnational vegan movement, some of the primary motivations for giving up dairy. So you have artificial insemination, the forceful artificial insemination of female cows to get them to be productive and stay productive throughout their milk, uh, their milk producing life. The second is that male calves are killed at birth or given away shortly thereafter for slaughter and that they really don't have much of a chance at all and they're stripped away from their mother. That's another thing that is of course emphasized within transnational veganism. This isn't a particular Jane concern, but they're seeing the opportunity to highlight it as a form of violence that they think needs to stop. And the third is the, that retired cows are killed early. So mothers, when they stop producing, they go in for slaughter as Jonathan was mentioning, India uh, has a huge, uh, leather and, and meat production from cows, and these dairy cows end up in that kind of situation, both there as well as in the United States. So you can see the point here is that they're pointing out concerns that are not Jane specific, but they see an opportunity to practice and perfect more closely perfect the practice of ahimsa as well as for karma, as we'll see in a second. What I found really interesting uh, on the Jane Vegans website is how they tie this all together in a really interesting Jane way. Because if you go and you look at the reasons for giving up dairy, as you see here on the website from the screenshot, wedged between environment, health, and then there's a tab for animals, is this word self-control. And if you click on self-control on that link that you see there, what pops up is this really interesting article on samyama, which in the Jain tradition means self-restraint, has a different meaning than in like Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, means self-restraint. The type of self-restraint or self-control that helps you prevent karma flowing from flowing into your soul. So the main point here is that wedged within these kind of transnational vegan concerns of environment, health, and animals is a call for the practice of self-control according to a Jain cultural logic. And so they're, they're using it as an opportunity to, to put that into practice, to put, the, put that into play. Now, Jonathan and I created a WhatsApp survey. So we dropped a survey into WhatsApp into this international group of set what was 79 members at the time that I put it in there. We received 33 responses, so we had about a 42% response rate. 
And the ages were all across the board, as you can see, from 19 to 84, and the average age was somewhere in the middle. So this is kind of all across the spectrum. It's not, as was you know, previously thought, it's not just kind of like the old aunties and uncles in the Jane community telling the younger generation, hey, if you do this violence, there's going to be karma and the, the younger generation saying, no, that's not true. Like, or we practice it for another reason, just because it's not nice to, to eat animals. What we're seeing is that even young Janes are articulating, some of them are articulating their practice of veganism in Jane karmic terms. And I'll give some examples of that in a second. 13 were female and 20 were male of the respondents. So we haven't quite looked at that too deeply about why there was such a gender disparity, but it's kind of a small pool to, to make any big assumptions yet. Um, but the main thing is that 18 out of those 33, so more than half, indicated that Jane Karma theory did inform their decision to be vegan. And again, they were spread across all age ranges, the average age being 50 years. And the younger, or the, the other ones who said, no, Karma theory is not part of my decision to be Jane, uh, a, a vegan, um, were also spread across a number of years and had a similar average age. So that's some of the data, because we know some people want to see the data. That's some of the data that, the main data that popped out of this survey that we did. But what were people actually saying? So I'll give you a few examples. They were really linking ahimsa and karma together when they responded. So these are pretty typical examples. So here you have a 30 year old female from the UK, Jane Vegan, who's saying, yes, karma and nonviolence are inherently linked. So that's kind of a simple answer. Um, but there were more articulate answers as well that went into describing how karma works and how uh, veganism is related to that. So here you have one that says, we have learned, this is a 39 year old female from the UK. We have learned that if you are violent, you are attracting Papa Karma. If you are vegan, you are far less violent to animals and the environment than a vegetarian and attract far less Papa Karma. I became vegan, vegan for this reason. So you can see that she's describing her practice of veganism in comparison to vegetarianism, by which she's probably focusing on the dairy. And she's also describing it using those karmic terms that we saw in the Tadbharata Sutra before. So this is the thing that at the very beginning of this whole study, I found interesting with my friend in Switzerland who was doing similar things. The next one is a 44 year old male from Switzerland who said, one of the best ways to reduce existing karma and control influx of new karma is by living a life that causes least harm to all six types of living being bodies. And then he names off the bodies in a similar way that they're listed off, for example, in the Acharanga Sutra and also in the Tadbharata Sutra. And this is in response to the question, all of these are in response to the question, does Jane Karma theory cause or influence your decision to be vegan? And if so, how? And he's basically saying yes, and this is the way to do it. And then here's an, another short example from a male in the UK who's 68, so a little bit older, being good reduces buildup of bad karma in response to that same question. So these are just some uh, samples of some of the answers, short and long, that we got. You can see some of them are using pretty technical language um, and others are kind of just saying, yes, there is a connection between these things. The third case study I'd like to finish up with is Vegan Janes in the United States, founded in 2010 by Jenna Shaw and Christian Kohler in Northern California. They have a website here. You can see veganjanes.com which you're welcome to go check out. They have lots of great resources and recipes and uh, something in particular that I'll show you in just a moment that I find particularly interesting. And I was just corresponding actually with Jenna this morning before this presentation about. They consider veganism, not surprisingly, as a modern expression for ahimsa, for nonviolence or non-harming. And Jenna is also the committee chair of Jenna's Ahimsek Eco Vegan Committee which is an internal committee within JANA, which is the 72 organizations, Jane organizations in North America. And through that particular committee, she's really pushing for, uh, for Janes to understand these opportunities that we're pointing out to reduce their violence significantly. And um, she's doing that through that at the committee level within the organization. This is the thing I wanna highlight about vegan Janes that I find to be uh, among a lot of other things unique because what they are doing is on their website, and these are all screenshots from their website, is they're highlighting the authority of Jain ascetics from India who are calling for the giving up of dairy. And what Jinnah and others have told me is that Jains won't go vegan or at least give up dairy until the ascetics tell them to do so, especially in India, but then even in the diaspora where they have authority, this could have some, some big impact. So she's starting to highlight 
how this is actually happening. And these are just some examples here. The first person, Sri Charukirti Batarak, as you see, said he situates veganism within the trajectory of Salekana in this video. So he says, yes, uh, Mahavira, according to Mahavira's teachings, we should all be vegan. We need to give up dairy. And this is the start of the process of starving oneself to death for the most noble death in the Jain tradition of Salekana. So it would start now. This would be the first thing you do is you, you give up dairy and you become vegan. So I, I encourage you to go watch these videos if you want to hear more. The second interesting one is this Digambar Muni who you see here, Vihar Sagarji, who learned about the cruelty of dairy from a Delhi-based organization called the Fauna Police, who you can also look up. The Fauna Police is an animal rights, animal protection organization that helps all kinds of animals, including cows, and points out the violence inflicted on animals in India, and particularly in urban India. When this Digambar Muni found out about the violence of the dairy industry, he himself stopped consuming dairy and started advocating and teaching for Jains to adopt a dairy-free diet. And he's using it with the tools and the pictures that the fauna police are giving him, which very much reflect the same concerns we've been talking about from transnational veganism, these, these sort of violent um, animal rights and uh, environmental issues that come along with this, but particularly the way that it affects the animals themselves. And finally, number three, uh, so, uh, uh, Sadvi Vaibhav Shri cites the Uttara Dhyayana Sutra to advocate for giving up dairy. Okay, uh, in the Uttara Dhyayana Sutra, there are some verses that say that a true ascetic, essentially, a true, a true ascetic within the Jain tradition does not consume dairy. Uh, it would not, uh, they would not be a true ascetic. Okay, so she cites that to kind of give scriptural authority for why Jains should not be, uh, and particularly ascetics, but also all Jains should not be consuming dairy. But then if you go through and look at the translation of the transcription on uh, the Vegan Jains website, she's giving all the reasons that Jonathan just mentioned, or a lot of the reasons about the violence of the cows, the very intricate ways that the females are treated, the way that the calves are treated. And so the reasons very much reflect this sort of transnational discourse that are now coming through the teachings of various ascetics, and there are more. Um, and so, I, yeah, I encourage you to, to take a look at that. So in closing, I just want to bring us back to kind of what we were talking about at the beginning, ancient wisdom, new opportunities. So you see here on the left, this is the ancient wisdom that Jains consider to be the ancient wisdom, or at least the classical wisdom of Jain, Jainism, which is these seven tattvas. And among those are the practices of sambara, trying to stop karma from flowing into your soul from violence that you inflict on the world, and nirjara, to burn away the karma that's already on your soul. What we're seeing is that veganism is being sort of broadly construed as a form of tapas to affect this process. And instead of seeing it as a sort of uh, a bastardization of tradition or something like that, we are interpreting it as a, a continuity or a continuation of tradition, a very, a very fluid way of interpreting Jainism in the diaspora, and now even more increasingly in India, to what is would be considered uh, the, the highest form or practice of ahimsa, especially in a householder lifestyle. Um, and so a lot of Jains that I've talked to who are not vegan and are actually against veganism, construed as a Western concept, right? Which historically is problematic because Jainism is, has of course influenced the practice of both vegetarianism and transnational veganism, first of all. So it's kind of like, and, and our peer reviewer said this, it's kind of like a pizza effect. This practice of eating in a particular way that's influenced by many things, including Jainism, is coming back and, it, and showing itself as a new opportunity for Jains to practice tapas to another level. And it's combining together these two things of you know, transnational veganism and Jane's soteriological concerns aimed at achieving ultimately a better rebirth or liberation. So that is all we had for you today and we look forward to hearing from you in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you, thanks so much to both of you. That's a fascinating, nice uh, overview as well. Plenty of food for thought. Oh, I, hadn't, I didn't even plan that pun, but uh, um, now, we haven't got any questions yet in the Slido, so I hope people will are aware of how to use that and put some in there. But I've got lots of questions, so I can kick us off. Um, first of all, so I'll just to recap for everyone actually about the Slido. So you go to sli.do and then put in the number be in the chat, and then you can get on the um, onto the, the, the question forum. 
So I was just wondering, I couldn't help wondering whether there are any precedents in India for the concept of veganism amongst Jains. I mean, how in the past have Jains justified uh, consumption of dairy in that, um, you know, they must be aware of these of the problems that, that you've that you've highlighted in the dairy industry and the you know the inherent himsa that's going on i mean in the past would, would it have just been a sort of head in the sand and i suppose thereby uh inferring was it anumata karma you mentioned you know by letting you know not say anything about it and also what was the other term for having so uh, the, the was it the karita karma as well i suppose having someone else do your dirty work for you um, but presumably there have also been Jains who've been directly involved in the dairy industry or providing dairy products for the, the Jain tradition. So I'm just yeah, wondering whether there are any precedents for this or has it not occurred to Jains until uh, as a result of the kind of global veganism movement? Yeah, Jonathan, would you like me to take that? I can start. I know Jonathan also has some some speculation about this and some of the research he's doing. Thanks, Jim, for the question. Um, so, for, so far what I've seen, what I would like to do is to go do some kind of an ethnography on the ground there when it's possible to do to see like, what are people really thinking about dairy? Um, but a lot of the responses that I get about why Jane's who are not or vegan wanna stay vegetarian is they have this kind of sense that the vegetarianism that they are practicing is ancient, it's connected to this ancient nonviolent diet that goes back thousands of years and that to, to violate that diet or to think, to even call that into question, it's like we are the torchbearers of nonviolence, of course vegetarianism is okay, um, is, is kind of problematic. So there's also kind of this like cognitive dissonance between like what's happening on the ground and, and what they believe about the Jain tradition that, um, that the Jain vegans are trying to bring together and like point out like, look, there's there's this belief that we hold this ancient wisdom in this tradition, but it's not being, um, it's not as, as nonviolent as it used to be. But even when I say when it used to be, Jonathan can, can chime in on this. Um, there's, the, even if you look back, there's this notion again, as, as the cow is the, the giving mother that Jonathan mentioned. Jonathan, I don't know if you wanna say anything more about that, but I guess what I'm saying is um, there's this belief that somehow the cow was this giving mother um, or that the cow was treated better in ancient times. And, and now it's kind of, it seems like, as you're saying, a head in the sand thing until these, these moonies, these, these ascetics are starting to point it out now um, on the ground. So I wanna go see them, meet them in person, these ascetics who are giving these teachings to see how they're articulating it more carefully. Okay, so, so, so just before we go to Jonathan, can I just butt in there and say about you know, these ascetics as well, where, where do you think, I suppose you haven't done the ethnography yet, so maybe you can't answer the question, but where are they getting the idea from? Of, you said was there's some organization, was it Delhi Fauna, that had uh, influenced one of the guys, but how, you know, is, presumably this is a new phenomenon amongst, amongst even the ascetics. It seems like it is. I mean, I'm not aware of, um, of other ascetics over the, these are like examples from over the past few years, but others who've been to India and interact with the ascetics might be able to, in this group yeah. might be able to say better, but they, they, a lot of them from what we're seeing, the language that they're using is coming from these kind of, these organizations like Fauna Police that are plugged into these larger organizations that are, that are using the same sort of rhetoric or uh, motivations as what we're calling transnational veganism. So some of it at least is coming from these other voices, but I also see how it's um, there now. Jains are starting to contribute to what veganism is, if that makes sense. So mm. it's kind of becoming a contested, more even more contested, as Jonathan said. And there's veganisms, um, yeah. So thanks. Do you want to add that, Jonathan? So yeah, sure. So right, it's a fascinating question of of this kind of idea of like how 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 given the sensitivity and the sophistication of these kind of harm taxonomies is this absent then these things that we're saying right now, especially are so obvious. Mm. Um, and I'd say, first off, I think that there is a longstanding tradition and I think a good analogy, or I, I, you know, I attended a recent talk by Jeff Barstow on Tibetan nomads and, and meat consumption. And Jeff has written a lot on this. And I think that first there's the sense that akin to flesh milk was considered as like absolutely necessary for human health or at least some optimizing substance. Um, and maybe this comes from its kind of, you know, uh, central 
uh, location in, in Vedic ritual and Vedic culture and so on, but we, we don't need to go much further than that. Um, and so there's a sense that it's absolutely necessary, in which case it constitutes the kind of necessary evil. Um, but Matthew Scully in a, in a book called Dominion, which is about kind of more Christian approaches to this, has this remarkable quote that we could use in so many contexts. And he says, you know, when a, when a necessary evil is no longer necessary, it's just evil. Um, and I think this is what's happening for Tibetan nomads who now realize either that meat actually has negative health outcomes, given if they have alternative items, you know, around which is happening in Tibet, um, for better or for worse. And the same is the case with dairy, right? We're seeing this as well, that it's, it becomes like a non, it's a, a non-necessity. So that's one. Uh, I think also there is this notion of the sacralization of the bovine, um, which is deeply problematic, at least that was presented to me, I think, um, in understanding it. And Kathy Albanese, who also was at UCSB where I am, used to say, well, are we talking about sacred animals or sacred resources? And it seems like cows are sacred resources. They're not sacred animals. And then what you, you see in the process of sacralization, either like two things, you become a, a sacred resource on the one hand, or on the other hand, you become so sacralized as a divinity, right? Like bovine as mother goddess, as mother India herself. And what gets lost in, in these two forms of sacralization is the actual animality of bovines. So it's odd, it's like when you divinize or commodify animals, what you do is you eliminate them as sites of actual harm. Either they can't be harmed because they're objects or they can't be harmed because they transcend their own animality as like an idea or as a goddess. And I think these are ways in which it lends itself into this uh, rhetoric of consent, um, which is why, you know, why a lot of feminists in the US in animal rights circles have very much focused on dairying and egg industries because they seem to be predicated on like chickens that give their eggs up um, and that cows who give their milk over in certain ways. And we can talk about the numerous ways in which these animals have been biologically engineered to produce so much uh, secretions that it, it's actually, you know, it's, it's their own bodies are actually sites of harm just by their continual existence. Um, so I think that's, that's another uh, aspect. And then lastly, we could say maybe it's also like non-recognition that, that milking was ever conceived as a serious harm. And this could be because yes, um, while non-industrial farming certainly involves forms of harm, but India is, is increasingly industrializing akin to China, um, you know, industrial animal farming is just, has introduced a kind of hellscape of harms that's like kind of Dantean or, or Buddhist in its, in its layout um, when, you, when you think about it. You know, thanks. Okay, great, thanks. Well, the, the questions are coming in, but I'm just gonna quickly, get, I've got a couple more points. Well, one point, one question that I wanna get in before we turn to the, everyone else and use my chair's privilege. One thing I thought might be of interest to you, I don't know if you're aware of it, but I, I've spent a lot of time with Hindu ascetics and you know, they're almost always um, vegetarian, you know, in the, in the usual Shud Shakahari, you know, Vaishnav vegetarian way in India. But then if they if they sort of take that further, they'll go to a diet called Palahar, Palahara, which literally means fruits, but actually it's more sort of uncultivated uh, food. I think that's where it comes from. But then if they go further with that, the last restriction is is uh, what they, in Hindi, they call it Dudadhari, or, or in Sanskrit, I suppose it must be Dugdhahara. So milk, you know, the last thing they will give up is milk, even before, you know, so there are a few sadhus around who live only off milk. So I think that's kind of indicative of how in, ingrained it is, as you said, as a, something that's kind of seen as sacred and essential for life. Um, so I've got one, one final, a question i suppose what, one thing that occurs to me that maybe what as you say you know before it was a necessary evil now it's an unnecessary evil um i think that was was that so i don't know if that was jonathan that was christopher i think wasn't it jonathan, yeah. it was jonathan um but because as i understand it in fact a vegan diet is sort of in you know no no traditional society has ever been vegan have they because Ultimately, you need to you need to supplement that diet don't you, with certain vitamins B12, as far as I'm aware. But you guys will know better than I do. Is that the case? I mean, is it is it possible? I mean, do you think this is again is one of the reasons why it's only happening now? Is because science and understanding of diet has got to a point where uh, you know we know how you can do it. It's now become unnecessary to eat dairy or meat, whereas in the past it, it was necessary. 
That's probably a question Chris, for you. Chris. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, this is, you know, these are like a lot of them are small debates about, about supplements and so on and, and why we need to supplement B12 now, given kind of the hyper sterilization of our food systems and, and kind of produce and so on. Um, but I think kind of what's important to me in, in certain ways is, yes, I mean, I don't know of a society that has been vegan, but I also view kind of veganism and even ahimsa is a horizon, right? It's not like an all or nothing situation. Um, if anything, the only perfection of ahimsa can come through death, right? Because, or through, excuse me, through moksha. I mean, in a sense, I always view moksha as actually a, a tool of ahimsa because by not being born, you can't perform acts of harm anymore. So it's a horizon and I think uh, the Jains, you know, are kind of, yeah, they are torchbearers in a sense of trying to meet that horizon. Um, but there's also a sense in which like kind of physical optimization never seems to be a, I shouldn't say never, but it doesn't seem to be the kind of main focus of these traditions, like being physically fit for as long as possible, right? You're under certain forms of avidya if you're thinking that this is somehow going to be a, the correct path. I mean, so much of it is deprivation, right? So much yoga practice in certain contexts is deprivation um, and austerity. So I think that um, on the one hand, I just would say that it's a horizon and you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's now that it's not necessary anymore, if it ever was, um, isn't it just evil, right? This is kind of what Scully is saying. And then second, um, these traditions don't really seem to prize longevity in and of itself anyway, or physical kind of fortitude uh, yeah that makes good sense. Just, uh, yeah. traditions yeah. Mm. okay thanks Jonathan right I better I better stop hogging everything and move to the slide where the god oh, wow I haven't been paying attention there's tons of them okay uh first one's anonymous so I will read that one out it's top of the charts uh is there also the concept of asteia i.e non-stealing in Jainism which I think there is isn't there uh, an example and I think I guess the question is is this related to Ahinsa in that, um, you know, a chicken lays an egg and then a human consumes it without its permission. Is that part of the principles behind uh, Ahimsa? Y yes, 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 thank you. So, um, of course, yes, Asteya is, is, is among the five vows within the Jain tradition in, in the Tathvarta Sutra, um, so not stealing. And so from an ethnographic perspective, whenever I talk to Jain vegans or read Jain vegan discourse on websites, in addition to ahimsa, one of the major things that they cite is uh, that we are stealing. They use the the language of stealing, and they often put you know, stea in 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 brackets. There, we are stealing milk from the mother cow and from the calf. So that is something that I encounter um, quite frequently, in in at least in my ethnography. Okay, great, thanks. Um, next is uh, Sonia who's given her name so if we can let's see if we can go to Sonia please you're getting there any luck hi sorry do you want me to sorry I wasn't I'm sure if you're reading it from Slido or do you want me to say no, sorry if you, if you put your name then you, then we go to you too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. what I wanted to find out is that, you know, it's very interesting to find out the vegan concept and um, I'm a Jain myself, but just want to understand how this is actually being adapted with Jain diaspora in terms of accepting veganism, just with everything which is happening out in particularly the Western world today, to how it's actually being being managed with the, the Jains right now, you know, who, who actually are in India. And I'm talking more of the younger generation, because I know you mentioned that you've got some statistics on the young, younger generation, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just understand that because I see a lot more talk happening with the diaspora around this than what I see in India. So it'd be just good to understand how, how the trends are taking place around there. Uh. Is Chris, do you want to take that? Oh. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't pick up the last uh, about 10 seconds of that because my internet connection was unstable. But I think what you're asking is, is how this concept of Jain veganism is being accepted in India, particularly among the youth um, who, and, and on the ground. Is that what you're asking? Um, and in the diaspora, probably. So what I'm, I, I the, my first answer is I don't, no, 100%, because I haven't done any ethnography on this particular topic 
on the ground in India. But I will say that I have talked to Jains in the diaspora who've made it very clear that one of the reasons, and these are young Jains who've told me this, one of the reasons that the Jain centers and Jain families in general will not go vegan is because they want to retain their youth membership who in many cases are kind of um, not even vegetarian. So to ask them to go from that to being vegan or to suggest they should be vegan um, is threatening and, and it's further, they see it as a form of deprivation. So I think you know, the, the response I've been hearing about um, from the youth side of it is that they're scared to scare the, the youth away. Uh, I don't know if that's also true in India. Um, and then the other reason I've been hearing is that, um, and this is the language that that people use when they speak to me about it is the the aunties don't and the moms don't want to change their the the way that they cook. They're so used to cooking with all these things at home that it would be a big transition for them. So it's like kind of those two things uh, within the household and within the community that are some of the major driving forces that 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 are causing actually like these frictions between going vegan and not going vegan within families and within the broader community. And I think what's at stake here, and Jim brought this word up uh, earlier when he was asking this question, is that this word shakahari, which um, Sulek has shared with me, Sulek James, and others have for debate and, and, and in contention in, in Jane dietary discourse, because what some of the ascetics are doing is reinterpreting this concept of shakahari as dairy free. Um, there, and some of them are even pointing back as Parveen Jain, who's also here has pointed out to me, they're pointing back to the fact that Mahavira, at least in the text that they're engaging, was, was drinking water and not milk. So they're kind of saying like, look, um, and this is also on Vegan Jain's website, if you listen to some of the videos, um, there's no scriptural evidence that that Mahavira was was drinking milk. He was drinking water. So yeah, there's a whole there's a lot of reasons. But um, and these are what's 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 really at stake here is how to define shakahari, and not make it feel like it's becoming a Western veganism, particularly in India. Okay, great, thanks. Um, lots of questions. Um, there was one that has just come up. Yes, exactly. I wanted to ask this question. Uh, and I, I think I can probably guess the answer, but regarding engineered food, cultured meat, in which they're not harming animals, but they're still made from animal cells originally, is there room for these foods in Jain veganism or Jain vegetarianism, I suppose, as well? I can begin to answer that from ethnography and then I'll turn it over to you, Jonathan, maybe. Yeah. Um, so the, the few Jains that I have talked to about this, and I'm thinking right now of Dr. Narendra Parson, who's also very much uh, in favor here of this particular topic, once said to us in a Zoom meeting that, that it seems like a great idea. He's a member of the, the community here, uh, Jain community here, uh, these, these sort of like lab grown meats, because the amount of violence, according to him, inflicted on the animal uh, is is far less than actually slaughtering and raising animals and so on and so forth. So from kind of a like harm perspective, it's that is being interpreted at least from the people I've spoken to from a, the degree of harm perspective. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Jonathan. But that's the ethnographic kind of side of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think this is actually a topic in a number of religious communities. I know Jewish communities are dealing with this. Like, can you eat lab grown, say, like pork? Right, no animals killed. No animals killed. It comes from a, st a stem cell that is uh, cultured, and so there is this, you know, a moment in time that has never possibly existed in the imagination of any one of these times. Thinking that we could have like actual animal flesh without the animal, um, and so I think in that in that moment or in that discussion. Uh, which I think is, is extremely important in discussions of veganism um, or, or say you would say animal ethics is separating, are we talking about substances? Or are we talking about animals, right? Um, is the question, is, it, is there some kind of uh, wrongness or, or negative aspect of eating like meat qua meat, like as a substance, like it's tamasic or it's heavy or it's heating or it's this or it's that, or it clouds the mana, you know, and so it has it basically in that context, we could be talking about anything. We could be talking about corn or apples or any, it's just a substance um, in which the prehistory is kind of elided, right? It's almost as if it was grown. It doesn't matter. And in that context, I think that's where cultured meat sits. It starts to sit in that conversation. 
but if the concern, if the prohibition on eating flesh is a function not of the, the flesh, but of that prehistory, right, of the killing, um, and specifically that actually, right, when you eat flesh or an animal product, you're actually not harming an existing animal. You're actually contributing to the death of a future animal, which is, you know, people often say like, well, the animal's already dead, what does it matter? Um, but especially in kind of market engagements, meaning like in, in grocery stores or with sellers, right, you are in some way, even in more complex uh, commercial systems, it still operates uh, accordingly, you are contributing in a way to death. And if that's the reason, then that would be an argument in favor as to why you should not consume animal flesh. It's not because of the flesh itself, but it's because of what it, it does to future living animals. And so this is just a kind of a, <laughs> a longer discussion of why cultured uh, meat or clean meat as it's called. And there's also clean cheese and there's clean milk and there's all other kinds of clean products as they're called um, would probably you know, require some serious reflection in these communities as to whether they're banning products because of their products, the kind of intrinsic nature of the product or because of where it came from and what, it, and what its purchase uh, contributes to. Okay, thanks. Um, now, the next one is anonymous. It's, thanks for this wonderful presentation. Is there any specific reference to cows in the Jaina literature? So I suppose, I mean, I, I, I suppose the question is in, in the same way that in, in certain Hindu traditions, you know, the cow is, is sacred and that we find textual sources for that. Is there a similar veneration within Jain traditions? I suppose that's one for Christopher, isn't it? Yeah, um, I'm because I'm more of an ethnographer. I I don't look at that many Jane texts. So beyond these references to dairy that I've mentioned, that that I'm kind of following, I'm following the the trail left by these ascetics who are referencing this. I don't know. Um, beyond, of course, um, thinking about them in the hierarchy of life. Uh, that's one thing that comes to mind, which is that. There are, there are five sense beings, which are humans, for example, and, and other animals like cows, right? Um, and I'm not sure if that word is actually coming up in the Sanskrit literature, but I'm sure it is somewhere. Um, but I haven't done like a study of discourse, it would be an interesting one, of, of cows within um, Sanskrit texts. Jonathan, do you know of any? Oh, I mean, in a in the obviously in Hindu context, you're going, you've, you'll have many, and you actually have, I think, um, in a recent reference to maybe Stephanie Jameson's work, um, there's even as far back in Rig Vedic texts, which are valorizing the cow, also have instances of actual harm, like this notion that the mother cow bellows when their calf is taken. I don't have the citation in front of me, I was just reading it. So, I mean, I think you're going to find that in Puranic texts and in, you know, in, in even earlier kind of what we'd call Hindu proto-Hindu texts, you're going to find that. But in the Jain literature, you know, it's it's not um, kind of my archive. But I would be very surprised not to find that same uh, discourse about the giving cow and the kind of, you know, the indispensability of, of milk products or dairy products as a whole. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I got your specialisms the wrong way around there, didn't I? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I have a feeling that there must be as well. It's, um, I suppose it requires further research. Uh, here's an interesting one to both. Um, did you ever come, come across the 8th century prodigious poet Abu al Allah al Ma'ari, who preempted veganism in the West and in Jainism by a thousand years? <laughs> Short answer, maybe. <laughs> no, for me, but I'm now <laughs> curious. No, I mean, not, not to my memory, but I actually do run in enough circles where uh, in many times kind of this like religious studies animal <laughs> circles where oftentimes people invoke the words of like a mystic or whether it's in the Christian tradition, which you'll find as many as well, um, or in, um, you know, in, in Islamic traditions as well. So, you know, it doesn't come to mind, but I wouldn't be surprised either. Okay. I'd also be curious to know why people are making that or, or, or citing that as an ethnographer, I suppose. 
Uh, and someone has mentioned, I think you mentioned this because you talked about Milarepa. I didn't, didn't you mention Milarepa briefly, Christopher, and then Mahavira? But isn't there a history of plant based diet with Milarepa being an example of someone living off nettles? That I don't know. I, I didn't mention that. Um, yeah, I have. I, I mean, I've heard that. So he's made, he turns green, doesn't he, in the sort of traditional hagiography? I don't know how old the, the legend is, but I had heard that. Um, I mean, I think it is important to note, and Jane, uh, sorry, uh, Chris can perhaps talk about it more, right? The ideal, even in Jainism, is like a fruitarian, but also dropped items, right? So we're getting to the point Chris said earlier that, that plants are, uh, you know, the least himsa causing foods, but even ideally, it's actually not right, not even growing plants. I mean, it's like root vegetables. It's not necessarily because of the root vegetables, but also the two sensed organisms and higher that are embedded in the soil that one will cause harm to by uprooting those vegetables. Um, and then the plants themselves um, are, at least in that uh, world, sites of harm. But then um, actually, ideally, it would be like fallen vegetables, right? Um, or excuse me, fallen fruits and other vegetables. Hmm. Uh, God, there's so many I'm sorry I'm finding it hard to navigate but here's what, an interesting one do, uh, do Jains use water mixed with milk for Abhisheka in temple worship as Hindus do I suppose that's why the question's been asked yeah yes I believe they do and I also have found recently um, I think it's on the vegan Jains website and other sources of like Jain veganism that there's a call to kind of stop that practice altogether um, to, to, to eliminate the dairy. And there are ascetics that are calling for Jain ritual to be performed without the milk because of its connection to the, all the industry that we just uh, mentioned before. So that's also a topic of debate within Jain uh, vegan communities, whether or not that should continue. Mm. I suppose yeah, because I I mean I'm not I'm no expert with that huge the, the, the Maha Mustakabi Sheikh or whatever it's called of in Shravana Belagola. That's certainly milk, isn't it? I remember seeing film of that. There's a lot of milk getting a lot of milk going down, yeah. Okay. And we'll we we're, we're pretty much over time. Do you mind if we go for one more? I think we've got one more in there. Well, there's plenty more, but I, there's one that I like the look of and I need to find it again. Um where was it? Well, I think you sort of answered this, but anyway, does the rhetoric around you, this was in your in your presentation, but does the rhetoric around veganism evolving in Jain communities tend to focus more on the self? Are there any examples of activism, e.g. socio-political messaging? I mean, you gave that table of the, the, the chat from the California Center, who certainly included both aspects, but I wonder yeah, which, um, what's the sort of dominant narrative? Is it more uh, kind of animal welfare or is it more uh, tapas and looking after oneself i would say that primarily i don't want to over uh emphasize the karma side of it although it's a big part of it the the common first expression that i will always get i think unsurprisingly is it's ahimsa and compassion so some form of jivdaya or some kind of compassion for animals um and so that's usually the primary motivation and there's a sort of i guess you could say a political, often a political attitude within Jainism in, in certain discussions and, and particularly within this discussion where um, they sometimes will say they don't want to make it political. Um, and there's good reason for that. Uh, there have been even attacks on Jains recently um, that I don't know if they've been in the media yet, but attacks on Jains in the US who are doing these practices. So um, in terms of making it a, a political statement, um, there is some, some pushback against this. And let me give you one example of that. Last year on Thanksgiving, um, I fasted. And out of that activity that I did, we created this committee within Jaina where we said, okay, next Thanksgiving, let's get a thousand Jains to fast around the country, kind of to kind of stand witness to the violence of Thanksgiving on all levels, you know, colonial, um, the turkeys and everything like that. Well, as the, the discourse has gone on about this particular project, um, there's been a call to kind of be careful about pushing too hard against American culture, particularly in the times that we're living in right now, because um, Jains don't want to be seen as, as causing friction. They want to be seen as an example, an inspiration. Um, and so I think rather than being political and like kind of hard power political, they, they, they 
operate more on the level of soft power in terms of cultural soft power and trying to affect change through positive example rather than creating some like structural change um, through through political activity. But Jonathan might want to commit comment on this because as he said at the beginning with veganism, no matter what veganism it, veganism it is, the effect is the same. Do you want to say something, Jonathan? I would just say something briefly. I know we, we've run over, but I think uh, on, on, a, on a different angle of this, I think what's an interesting question, um, I think a recent, uh, recent book by James Staples came out, uh, Sacred Cows and Chicken uh, Manchurian. Um, kind of touches on this as well, and, and people like Radhika Govindrajan's book has, has touched on this as well, is that there's a situation in which, not just with Jane's, but we can talk about Jane's as well, it's, there seems to be a highlighting of Jane values, but also a desire for integration, right, in the diaspora, right, and or say you don't want your children to be kind of ostracized or picked on and bullied, so you tend to adopt the practices, say, of the group to assimilate, um, and hence, um, but you, I mean, you see this, right? You know, you see this now for, for, for decades and decades of say Indians traveling to the UK and starting to take up say meat eating practices as a way to kind of experiment or you hear this in Gandhi's writings as well, right? To experiment, but also to assimilate. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that there seems to be on the one hand, a desire to uphold certain values, but then also to kind of develop, to, to enter into the 21st century or to be more cosmopolitan. And so this is huge around the discourse of meat eating in India where, or eating beef specifically that someone like Staples highlights where um, to not eat beef in certain areas is viewed as a kind of allyship with the caste elite. So you actually consume beef as a performative gesture of solidarity right and hence but what's odd is that in the west it's actually that's we've kind of like kind of passed that moment a little bit and now it's turning back in the other direction probably because of the anthropogenic uh con contribution to climate change there's also animal rights things but i think in in the west it's actually turning the other the other way we've already been talking about cell-based meats we're already talking about things that have, that have shifted and so i think that the case in India is quite different, but there is always a, and because the religious climate is so is so uh, different, especially in the realm of dietetics, that um, there's a kind of desire to uphold certain values, but also assimilate or express solidarity. Um, but I think what people like Narayanan and even Govindrajan and others point out is that often what gets left, left out in this discussion is like the third party, which are the animals that are the ones who are directly affected, right? It's usually like, Hindu nationalists and non-caste people or you know, Dalits or Muslims. And you know, it's a conversation about beef and the cows are over there like, hey, like, what about us? Like we're actually the ones who are literally the most directly impacted. And, and there are some really great scholars, not necessarily talking about India who, who discuss how this perspective needs to be, to be highlighted. Mm. Anyway. Great, yeah, thanks. Good to bring us back finally to the cows at the end there, yeah. Think about them. Okay, that's a, it's a really fascinating presentation from both of you. And as I say, lots of food for thought. You know, I, it's, it's, it's a great topic as well, isn't it? Because everyone eats, so everyone has to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Not that you can't say the same about everything in yoga study. Everyone's involved. Um, okay, well, I've just, yeah, we've gone way over. So thanks so much for taking up the time on this this, this morning. And um, morning for you. And so now what, what remains, I'm going to thank you myself, but then uh, we'll go back over to Theo. Who will uh, who will uh, do the, the the usual traditional goodbye? It's, it all feels traditional now. We've been doing Zoom for so long, but uh, we have our, our ways of doing it. So, Jonathan, Christopher, thanks so much. That was really fascinating. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the presentation. Thanks for having us.